problem of homosexuality in the seminaries. I can't review all of that uh, with you, but uh, the problem has even exacerbated itself this week. We're now finding out that the cover-up and corruption reach to the highest levels of the Vatican. Believe me, it is very painful for me to discuss this topic with you, but it's something that we must discuss because it does have an impact on our eternal salvation. This week I'm going to present to you some very practical solutions, uh, and solutions are not going to be quick fix. They're going to be long-term solutions. I told folks last week, I said, this situation that we have today is on a par with, if not worse, than the Protestant Reformation. And that took many, many years to correct the church and the problems that the church engendered over the years uh, before the Reformation, and then the correction came place with the uh, counter Reformation. Today we have uh, a gospel passage from uh, St. John, and I have to do a little bit of an exegesis with it for you, uh, because it is germane to what I am going to uh, talk to you about this morning. It's very important. John does not have an institution of the Eucharist in his gospel, as do the synoptic gospels. What we have in John in their place is the washing of the feet at the Last Supper. It takes place during the farewell discourse of the Lord. What John does have, though, is an explanation of the Eucharist in this sixth chapter of the Gospel. And we have been looking at this chapter over the last three weeks. When John's Gospel was composed, there were at least what we call six redactions. That means, in layman's terms, they were edited. The Gospel was edited at least six times. Now, that's not bad. The text that we have is the text that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. It is the canonical Word of God. However, if we don't begin to take this apart, unpackage it a little bit, we might not understand the uh, full import of what is being said today. In this part of the Gospel, called the Bread of Life Discourse, in chapters 35 to 50, we did that two weeks ago, Jesus is talking about himself, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Now a lot of people are thinking uh, of the Eucharist, but it's not the Eucharist that he's talking about. It's important for the Eucharist, but it's not the Eucharist that he's talking about. He's talking about himself as the bread which the Jews would understand to be wisdom, the bread of God. Wisdom is the bread of God. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. He who eats this bread will live forever. So whoever accepts Jesus as the wisdom of God, the Holy One of God, as this gospel today ends, is hearing God's word and, this is key, believing that Jesus is the wisdom of God, the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Now, from 35 to 50, we have that importance of belief in Jesus, and then we have what we call this uh, parenthesis, or this inclusion, and we have last week that Jesus said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have life within him, and that pertains directly to the Eucharist. But you cannot have that belief in the real presence of Christ unless you believe that he is the Son of God. Because how can anyone say, this is my body, this is my blood, eat my flesh, drink my blood, unless you are the Son of God. And that's why that portion of the discourse, the Bread of Life discourse, is placed right there. And then today we have a follow-up from 35 to 50, where we talk about belief in Jesus. We talk about the importance of belief. 
belief in Jesus. Now, in this gospel, the hard teaching is, in today's gospel, the hard teaching is that Jesus is the Son of God. And many leave him because they cannot accept that teaching. Many leave him. Many of his disciples leave him. But who remains? The twelve. And Jesus says to them, Are you going to leave me too? And Simon Peter says, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are divine wisdom. You are the Son of God. You see how important that is to understanding this text. Now, who then receives uh, the word of God as Jesus spoke it? It's the twelve. It's the apostles. And so the apostles are the ones that uh, pass on to us what we call the deposit of faith that God revealed to them what he says we must know for our salvation. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It is only through your word that we can be saved. Extremely, extremely important. Why? <coughs> Over these last weeks, and as I said, they, they've been depressing, uh, disgusting, astounding, and horrendous. I can't think of any more despicable thing that could happen to the church than what has happened over these last few weeks, or at least what has been revealed to us as to what has been going on. Now, we have some people who are saying to themselves, or saying to other people, I'm not going to go to church anymore. I have members of my own family that are saying the same thing. Well, people are looking for an excuse. The church is the body of Christ. The church has the truth that God gives us for our salvation. And the church has the Eucharist, which is our strength for us to get to heaven. The real presence of Christ. We have word and we have sacrament. And so there is an expression. <clears throat> you cut off your nose to spite your face. You don't go to church. You're the loser, not God. You're the loser, not the Pope or the Bishop or me. These people who use an excuse. Oh, you see, the church is no good, the priest is no good, everybody's no good. They're fake, phony frauds because they don't know what Scripture says. And you can tell them what I said. <laughs> Fake, phony, fraud. Now, a second part of this, you might hear some people saying, well, I'm not going to give any more money to the church because they're just using that money to cover up sex crimes. Another canard. Giving money to the church is extremely important. Not just because it keeps buildings open, not just because it pays salaries, but it is because it is what Jesus tells us to do in the Gospels. And what St. Paul tells the church to do in the epistles. The money is not just to keep a physical operation going, although we need a physical operation. But the money goes so that the Gospel can be proclaimed even by the weakest of its ministers, even by the most corrupt of its ministers, the gospel must be proclaimed. And the poor must be taken care of. And the sick must be visited. And the hungry must be fed. That's the word of Jesus, and that's where the money goes. So if anybody tells you, I'm not giving any more money, they're just looking for an excuse because they're nothing but cheapskates. Tell them I said that too. Now, Let's take a look at this uh, problem of money. Money is a problem. If you don't have it, it's a problem. And if you have it, it's a problem. Okay? Uh, let's talk about, uh, about money. Money is power. And money, like any kind of power, it can corrupt. And as Lord Acton said, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Now, what do we have to do as a church to make sure that 
the money given for the work of the church is used properly. This is extremely, extremely important. I've been in conversation uh, with uh, some canon lawyer friends of mine, uh, some of you folks here from the parish, and this is one of the suggestions that has come about. Raising money for the work of the church does not necessarily belong to the bishops and the pastors. It belongs to you, the people of God. It's no fun, I'm sure, for the bishop or Father Bob to have to go begging for money. You should be the ones who are doing the fundraising, doing the development. And you should be the ones who are choosing the programs and the places and the people to whom the money is going. That means that the lady has to take a role in not only making the money, but also in dispersing the money. Now that would take a little bit of a change in canon law. However, we also at this moment have a financial council in the parish. There's financial council in the diocese. If I were a bishop or if I were a pastor, I would want that financial monkey taken off my back. And I wouldn't want anybody to be saying they're doing something wrong with their money, or I'm buying silence from victims of abuse. The lady has to take responsibility for making the money and for dispersing the money. Number one. Number two. You have heard of the corruption and problem of homosexuality uh, in our seminaries. It is unfortunate seminaries are now being named that are being investigated. I am not so sure that the seminary system that we have today is suitable for the church that we have today. Our seminary system comes to us basically from the 16th century. Once again, the church was trying to clean up a mess from the Reformation. Seminaries are very much like little monasteries. You're taking men into these uh, very limited quarters with a very limited view of the world and are expecting them then to become priests who can take care of the spiritual and secular needs of our people. And many of them, after being sheltered in this seminary world, are unable to do so. And perhaps some who go to the seminary would never be able to do so. We need priests who are not just holy, but we need priests who also can speak to the culture, that can understand where you are coming from and what your needs are. The semi-monastic life that they are now living does not enable that. It also allows for them to be inbred, and in the present situation, it also allows for disordered sexual conduct. What do we do? We need a seminary? No. What we need is these young men perhaps to be trained in a more secular environment. To go to colleges and universities in the real world. And then to have some kind of attachment to a parish. And it should be known that they are considering the priesthood. And that they have a spiritual director, and a program may be very similar to the one that our permanent deacons are involved in. They take classes a couple of days a week. They have intensive focus periods, maybe a couple of weeks out of the year, where they go for special, special programs. And maybe the pastor of the parish has to be one that 
monitors their progress. And then the people of God vote as to the worthiness of this person to be ordained a priest. At the moment of the right of ordination, there is a recognition of the importance of the laity in accepting the young man for holy orders. You deem him worthy, and everybody starts clapping. They don't know the young guy from the Philippines. We need the people of God to help us discern a true vocation, a vocation that is going to help the church to speak to the needs of our contemporary society. The next area I want to talk about is the bishops. Right now we have a system, how does a bishop become a bishop? Well, I've been trying for years, I know who am I to say? <laughs> but I'll tell you how. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And very often, and I'm not saying they're bad men, it becomes that good old boys network. And there is no real accountability. In the old days, the ancient church, the people of God elected their bishops. I'll give you just one example, St. Ambrose in Milan in the 5th century. Ambrose was a civil administrator. He was a civil lawyer. And he acted as a governor in Milan. And the bishop died. Ambrose uh, was known to be of a devout nature, and the people decided, Ambrose, you be our bishop. And they would name him a priest and a bishop in one school. <coughs> and he became one of the greatest bishops the church has ever known. A saint, a great theologian, a defender, a defender of the faith. It's time that the people of God begin to choose those who are going to lead the church? Last, it may be time for us to seriously consider ordaining married men to the priesthood. Now you know my liberal tendency. However, however, not only is there a shortage of priests, but there is also a question as to the quality of priests that we are ordaining. I believe that a married man, nothing radical that I'm saying, why? We have married priests in the Eastern Church. We have married priests in our own country who are now part of what Pope Benedict established as a special ordinary for men who are Anglican or Episcopalian, who had families and want to become Roman Catholic. And so they are already functioning in our country and they are doing a good job. And maybe their experience of marriage will help other Christians who themselves are married, who want to enrich their spiritual life, or maybe somebody who can really help them to get through the difficulties of a marriage. And these married priests may very well, and I'm sure will, enrich the church in our country and throughout, throughout the world. As I said, this is not a short-term fix. It's not going to happen in my lifetime, and probably not going to happen in the life of most of us here, except the little ones might say. We're talking about 50 years. We're talking about 100 years. But we must begin the purification of the body of Christ and supply the body of Christ with the leadership that the body of Christ needs in order to proclaim the gospel effectively. Remember, I agree. Are you going to 
going to leave me too? And Peter says, no, Lord. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. God love you.